All right, good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us for our final Sydney Saxophone Network Q&A session for 2020. What a year it has been, and what an exciting adventure these Q&A series have been. Um, I like to certainly think of it as a, uh, a definite highlight for me this year, um, but that's not saying much because there has been much else going on but um, it certainly has been uh, quite informative and hopefully it has been informative for you and thank you uh, to each and every one of you for checking these out. Um, for our final session for this year um, I've asked uh, an esteemed colleague of mine uh, and longtime collaborator uh, and you know old mate um, who I'll read you out his bio because even though he's a really good friend um, I do forget sometimes how much he's done and it's an incredible amount. Um, and uh, we are joined this evening by um, esteemed classical saxophonist Andrew Smith. Now, Andrew Smith is probably one of the most um, prominent classical saxophonist players, uh, sorry, classical saxophone players here in New South Wales, if not Australia. Um, he is quite active um, doing a variety of things. Of course, uh, if you know anything about uh, what I do, then you know that he is a member of the Nexus Quartet uh, alongside myself, uh, Jay Burns and Michael Duke. Uh, but he also gets around playing um, various, uh, premiering new works by a lot of Australian composers such as Cyrus Morant, Tristan Coelho, Paul Castles, Lachlan Skipworth, Mark Olivero, uh, just to name a few. Uh, he has worked with numerous ensembles uh, apart from Nexus, such as the Sterilitzer Ensemble, the Sideband Ensemble Mongrel, uh, Serious Chamber Ensemble, Chronology Arts. Uh, he has freelanced with the um, uh, the Sydney Symphony Orchestra as well, uh, and he's given numerous performances all over the place. Uh, Australian Festival of Chain Music, Adelaide Cabaret Festival, Sydney Festival, the Aurora Festival, the International Society for Contemporary Music, World Saxophone Congress, local saxophone congresses, here, there, and everywhere. Um, he is also uh, currently a the sax sorry the saxophone lecturer at uh, the Australian Institute of Music here in Sydney. Um, without further ado, I'm going to stop rambling and just introduce the man himself, Andrew Smith. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you so much for having me, Nathan. No worries. Um, that's right. You can call me what you normally do because um, <laughs> that was hard. I'm like, and sure, Nathan. Yeah. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. Um, so let's kick it off with a bit of an icebreaker. Um, just to you know, get set the uh, set the scene, as we say. Uh, what made you pick the saxophone? What was the, the the catalyst for you to pick up this instrument? Well, the the dark truth is that I didn't initially start on the saxophone. Oh dear. So um, yeah, um, like like Jay, actually, I grew up in southwestern Sydney. Um, so I grew up in in Camden for most of my life, and um, I went to a very small primary school called Mawara, and we had about two hundred kids and. Rather unusually for the era, we actually had a primary school band, um, and it was pretty cool to be in the band. And I actually started on, on clarinet. Um, me and a bunch of mates started playing clarinet, and um, I've been playing clarinet for a year or two. And um, our our band director bemoaned the fact that we lost our only saxophone. Our only saxophone went to high school, um, and. For some reason back then there was only one saxophone in our band and um my dad had one at home which i'll explain in a second so i said oh look i have one at home i can't be that different the clarinet i'll, I'll give it a crack um because i suppose rather bizarrely my, my dad actually um my mum and dad were both school teachers um and not from musical backgrounds but um dad and his mates when they were in year three decided to like some of his school teaching rugby mates decided to, to form a band and not like a rock band, but like a, a wind band. Um, so dad had started playing clarinet in that and at the same time that I started playing clarinet in the primary school band. And um, dad had always wanted to play saxophone, so mum bought him one for Christmas. So that's why we had the saxophone at home. So I, yeah, I kind of started on it just because the saxophone player had left the school is really the, the dark truth about it. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> Okay. So that's um, my, yeah, no, no, no Lisa Simpson, no, no Hoots the Hour, just literally the saxophone player left our, our school band and I had been on clarinet. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. All right. Um, now, why don't you tell us a little bit about your, your early days and early studies um, from when you picked up the saxophone first, uh, leading up to your studies at the uh, Sydney Conservatorium. So maybe some of the early teachers that you had leading up to your time at the con. 
So yeah, that's that's pretty interesting. Um, again, southwestern Sydney, not a whole lot of the music scene there in the late eighties, early nineties. It's kind of remarkable in some regards that Jay and I are both here. <laughs> um, so my primary school band, we had a band, but no one had lessons. Like you just played in the band, the school band. We had a director, and there was no individual tuition or no. Um, nothing beyond that you just had the band classes so I I was effectively self-taught and my, my dad helped me mm -hmm. um, and that was me from clarinet to saxophone and um, towards the end of year five um, so I've been playing for three years by that point my dad figured that um, I was doing okay at it and I probably needed some help um, some real help not just um, him so he asked a local high school teacher, the head of music at his local high school, if there was anyone in Campbelltown to recommend. Looks like I lived in Camden. Campbelltown's the next big town. And he was fortunate enough for me to recommend um, Michael Watkin, who was also Jay's um, first saxophone teacher. So Michael lived in Kentland um, mm -hmm. and was actually a graduate from the Sydney Con and had learnt off Mark Walton. Mm -hmm. um, so once a week we did the 30-minute drive from Camden to Kent Lynn to, to have lessons when I was in, so that, I think it was term four in year five I started. Um, so I, I started my formal lessons quite late and I suppose that's where a lot of my initial problems came from, the fact that I spent the first few years of my playing without a teacher, so. Mm. And this was to, before internet and stuff. That's so it, got to yeah. Michael, didn't really know what an sure was, certainly didn't know what tonguing was and, and didn't really understand counting or, or anything <laughs> like that. So. Um, Michael grabbed a hold of me and um, like we started doing A and B exams and things straight away. So I think he like, he straight away threw me into third grade and things. And he also recommended um, to my parents halfway through year six that, oh, look, Andrew should think about going to a, a selective music school for high school. Like he should really audition for the, for the Con High and for Newtown. Um, my parents were like, oh, okay. So they, um, they put in an application for the Con High and they contacted Newtown and they got told that um, the, I, I, it was too late. The auditions were full. Right. Um, and then somebody pulled out and I got an audition and somehow I got into Newtown. Um, and that was massive. Like, hilariously, actually, um, we'll get to this later. I've now been teaching at the Conservatorium High School for 12 years, but um, I didn't get into the Con High. <laughs> um, did the audition when I was in year six. Um, I probably wasn't good enough. Um, but also Mark Walton wasn't on the panel that day. They didn't have a saxophone player. And anyway, I didn't mm -hmm. get him. Didn't deserve to probably. But um, Newtown saw something. I don't know what they saw. Mm -hmm. um, but I got accepted into Newtown and that was, um, that was massive um, for lots of reasons. So um, you're saying that the different teachers, I actually just learned off Michael from that end of year five, to the end of year 12. He was yeah. my teacher all the way through high school, even when I was at um, Newtown. I kept learning privately off him. Um, but then Newtown, a massive culture shock from southwestern Sydney. I, I went to the whitest primary school on the planet to um, Newtown when, when I started there. They actually like, they had proper like old school punks with the punk hairdos and goths and, and just your, your eyes exploded and... Um, all of a sudden, I was at a school where the performing arts were the it was the main deal, mm. and um, rocked into year seven, and there were these two twin boys called Ben and Nick Kerry, and um, a bunch of other people. And all of a sudden, my my ride through high school was amazing. I was surrounded by these incredible young musicians, um, lots who have gone on to have wonderful careers, um, and just a wonderful school. Um, you know, I was. My first two years there, I was in the, the junior concert band, but then I was lucky enough to play, you know, saxophone in the orchestra, in the big band, sax quartet, <laughs> the wind band, mm. um, all these different ensembles. So I had this wonderful experience going through high school, playing in lots of ensembles, as well as learning all your solo repertoire, your Amy B. Um, wonderful classroom music teachers who were fantastic at teaching me harmony and all those kind of important things. Um, but yeah, just surrounded by like-minded students and fantastic young musicians. So um, if it wasn't for Newtown, I wouldn't be here. Um, 
loved the school, still love it. Um, but it was responsible for teaching me so much as a, a young musician. So many of the skills that are in, so important, the ability to read music, um, getting used to performing, um, all these in, important skills. Mm. Well, it sounds like, yeah, it was a very um, exciting environment to be um, uh, growing up in. And um, as you say, like it seemed like performing arts was certainly at the fore uh, of the the culture of the school and um, yeah I think you know what music student wouldn't music student would love wouldn't love to be in an environment like that particularly in their early days now um, going onwards uh, once you finished at Newtown uh, <coughs> you ended up at the Sydney Conservatorium with uh, a bunch of us including myself and it's actually quite funny because when we um, uh, first met it, it was a bit of a fun, not many people know this but um, uh, so Jay and I were uh, students at the Sydney, uh, sorry, the Conservatorium High School, and you and Ben Carey were from Newtown. And for some reason or other, there was this yeah, initial sort of rivalry, or it was something strange about it. And it was quite funny because one of the first things that happened was Mark Walton put us all together in a, a saxophone quartet, um, and it was sort of like me and Jay were kind of like these guys, and then you guys are probably the same. But uh, it, anyway, it all uh, ended up changing. Uh, quite differently uh, during our time there. But uh, yeah, just sort of talk about the time at the Sydney Kong because uh, this is something that's come up lately um, into sort of uh, some of the Q&As where we're talking about um, the culture and the environment, uh, particularly in that tertiary level, which is quite an important uh, time for any professional player, That the sort of the formative years in that tertiary thing where you're transitioning from that student player into a professional player. Um, now, as you said, uh, there was four of us there at the time, but you know we went to uni with a bunch of other remarkable players. Um, but maybe guys. you could talk about yeah some of the, the uh, maybe some of the people that we interacted with and you know the things that we did in the course and you know part of the opportunities that you had during your time um, uh, starting off with the undergraduate part of your studies there. Okay, so um, I, it's really important to note I think that when we started at Mark Mark Walden was the head of Woodwind mm -hmm. and they still had those kind of roles. And I feel that Mark was massive in creating a culture of um, getting everyone on board. So the Woodwind faculty was really tight-knit. So that all the saxophone players, obviously the other saxophone players really well, but the whole Woodwind unit, and not just your own year, first or fourth year. You know, So we'd, we'd have Woodwind dinners, we'd have Woodwind tours, we'd have concerts together. So that you, you know, when you're in first year on saxophone, you knew the fourth year oboes really well. Mm. Things like that I thought were... Um, really great so as a woodwind unit you were you were really tight everyone supported each other went to each other's concerts and recitals so like the recital halls were always full for the the woodwind recitals because the the whole unit came along which i thought was um fantastic um i think we were pretty lucky too that like as a quartet um the wonderful david miller really took us under his wing um so David Miller, the, the pianist accompanist, um, but was the head of um, ensemble studies on chamber music when we were in undergrad, and it was a very it was a very different time. Um, it's hard to explain to students now, but um, really the internet wasn't such a big deal even then. Like um, I didn't get internet at home until we were in first year at uni, and. Um, I didn't use an email account. The, the one Sydney Uni gave me until fourth year when I had to for my honours. Hmm. Um, so one of the things that used to happen is that people, if they wanted live music for a function or an event, would contact the conservatorium and they would send out students. And that way you got the music, A, cheap, hmm. and B, you knew it was quality. But essentially, um, David used, used to send us out to things all the time. And not just like gigs for hire, but little festivals or regional excursions we ended up um in those first three years together from our first to third year and jay's second to fourth we did did a hundred concerts um and that, that that's remarkable um and students aren't obviously going to get that anymore i don't think like a hundred concerts is ridiculous yeah but um that was kind of i think at the time you can't remember you know that there weren't um people didn't have websites advertising their function group or things like that so like people used to yeah really contact the con to look for live music um and i think we were certainly the beneficiaries of that mm. um you know it, it, people talk about performance anxiety and it's something i've never really suffered from and i think it comes from literally from high school and uni i just did so much performing in high school at newtown and then at uni that i, I just never got nervous because i was so used to doing it all the time and the more you perform 
I, I feel the less it impacts you too. So um, there was Mark's head of unit. There was um, our time with um, David Miller. Um, Mark Walton teamed me up with Christina Leonard as a tutor when I was in my undergrad. And um, Christina and I got on really well in my undergrad. We had a, a great time together. She pushed me really hard. Um, and she always made me try and do things that I thought were beyond myself. And um, it always pushed me to be a better saxophonist and musician. And I thought that was, um, that was really good. Um, I was also, um, we were good friends with all the composers at, um, at uni. Um, we were great mates with them and that was wonderful too because it um wonderful in a lot of ways it was they loved it because we would play their music we loved it because we got new music to play mm. and then obviously later in life they become wonderful contacts that you know we still play their music um all, all the time yeah they became really good people to know but people like you know i i was at a function with mark Oliveira today because we're both on staff at aim and someone was asking us, you know, oh, how long have you two known each other and been, you know, working with them? I'm like, well, 20 something years now I've been playing Mark's music. Um, and it's the same for people like Tristan and Paul, mm. you know, um, I've known them so long now. But also, it's, um, there's that great quote um, from Philip Glass about Juilliard. Like, what was the best part about Juilliard? And he says it was the cafe, you know, because at the cafe he got to meet everyone he needed to know for the rest of his professional life, you know, and um, whether it be your, your fellow saxophonists, the composers, um, string players, people like, you know, L, Luke Spicer, you know, the wonderful, wonderful brass players and other people that we've had in contact, we all, we all met them in our undergrad, you know, these wonderful people that have gone on to be important people in certain orchestras or in certain organisations. Um, so we were... There was a wonderful culture of mixing between the, with certain fields, I suppose. I never, I feel there's a distinct separation with education, but like we were really connected with the other units, like the string players, the brass, the percussion, the composition. Mm. Or maybe the vocal department was another Th that they void. Were, they mm. were <laughs> a life onto themselves. Um, so, yeah, I think it was just the, the opportunities I got um, that were so wonderful there and the, and the connections I made. Mm. Um, the Masters was different. Um, you and I both did our Masters together in Sydney. Mm -hmm. um, for those people that don't know that, Mark, uh, Nathan and I also studied our Masters together. We had a few years off in between the undergrad and the Masters because not many people did a Masters back then, but now it's kind of everyone compresses it all together. Yep. Um, but that was a, a very different experience and a really um, wonderful experience too. Obviously, that higher level is a different focus, a lot more on the, on the research side of things too. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and a different mix of people too like um, when we go to those classes um, it was like we were young too um, now we'd be old in the master's class but at the time you know it wasn't wasn't something that people went straight into so like you know we were doing with people like Paul Cutlin you mm. know um, and I was playing with Paul the other week you know we were talking about those days where we were doing the masters together and things like that so mixing with people like Paul and we had some wonderful time with people like Richard too you were you and I were very fortunate to be able to study with um, Michael Duke during our, our Masters as well, because Michael had come out from America at that point. Um, yep. So I had lessons off Jim, Michael and Christina during my Masters, and, and Michael pushed us in a different direction. He started the Conservative Victorian Quartet we played in with him, and he got us some great opportunities with the new new music ensemble, and I, I was lucky to tour to, um, to China and Hong Kong with Michael as well. Mm -hmm. So there were some... Um, some wonderful opportunities through our postgraduate time as well. Um, we were also given solo opportunities and concerts in Verbruggen and things like that, which were, were wonderful as well. So, yeah, lots of lots of people to meet, lots of performances to be had. Yeah, and lots of good memories. And lots yeah, of good memories. It's also, yeah, as you say, like um, it's, uh, yeah, really that sort of environment, just, you know, being that sort of, that scene, looking back at it now, yeah, you kind of think how, incredible it is and how fortunate we were to be you know in in amongst it at that particular time yeah um so i mean uh, obviously you know you went on to other things as well and i know sort of in between you also pursued a few additional uh studies and lessons overseas and i think 
not uh, not necessarily a formal study, but definitely lessons and approaching people. And one of the probably the first encounters you had was an experience uh, where we went to a small town in France, I believe. So maybe yeah, you can look, talk about uh, yeah some of your experiences with overseas teachers. Okay, yeah. So um, I think that you and I both agree that that first trip overseas for us was incredibly formative. Mm-hmm. Um, we went to, for those that don't know, Nathan and I, when we were in third year at uni, went to the, the Gap Summer School in the south of France, which is a, it's a wonderful um, and highly renowned um, event where essentially we were there, I can't even remember how many days, maybe 14 days, but essentially you, um, some of the best teachers in Europe. And in the morning we'd have our group lessons with one of these teachers, then because we were there as a quartet too, we'd get a chamber music tutorial with one of these people. Then there'd be a master class. Then there'd be a, a, a concert at night. Then you'd go out and then you'd do it all again. And it was um, wonderful. And we got to learn off people like um, Claude Delong, Arno Bornkamp, Christian Wirth, Jean-Denis Michat. Um, and the quartet in residence was the diastema quartet. You know, we mm-hmm. had um, such a wonderful time. We're so fortunate to learn off some of the great saxophonists and great pedagogues on our instrument. Um, so that was... Um, a real eye-opener um, for me and it was amazing for my playing um, a lot of a lot of issues I had in my playing um, I, I felt I made tremendous progress with them there particularly in regards to my embouchure mm-hmm. um, I thought my embouchure was a bit a bit manky until gap um, I was that with really... all the teachers or was there a particular teacher that sort of I know and Claude both okay. they both explained it in a particular way that just fixed it like that right um, in a way that I hadn't been told or taught before and it hadn't actually been focused on a lot with my playing um so um i got over there and everyone was onto me about it and they those two just um they just nailed it really succinctly um i actually had one lesson that was really negative um i just I, um i didn't quite grasp what the person wanted to do and i tried to explain that to arno and he said oh well like what that person is trying to say is xyz and then put it in another way that just made it really mm. simple for me and able to achieve. Um, so those, those two were really helpful in that, but it wasn't just embouchure. It was just getting inspired about our, our instrument, our art form, the possibilities. Um, th- those concerts are etched in my mind forever. Um, you know, how, mm. how lucky we were to see such wonderful world-class performances. Um, and Jean-Denis Michat's lesson we had in Gap, I still, you know, hold on to a lot of the notions from that particular lesson. Um, besides Gap, well, on that one trip, I also got to go to the North Sea Jazz Festival in Den Haag, which was amazing because Brecker was the um, featured artist that year. And we also yes. went to Bordeaux as well. Um, yeah, don't remind but, me about that. Um, yeah. I, I uh, went on a detour and I didn't go, unfortunately. You went to a nunnery and I got to see Brecker, you know? Yeah, you yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Look, I, I did a, a few more sojourns after that. I was very lucky that I had some great mates living in Europe and mm-hmm. I was able to crash on their floor and go and have lessons. So Jay was living in, Jay moved to London after his fourth year in Sydney. So when I finished fourth year, I just um, upped and spent uh, well over a month sleeping on Jay's floor. I, I mentioned this in our gig the other day and I, I you know, Jay would go off to work, I'd wake up, play saxophone for a few hours, um, go and stroll the British Museum and meet him for a pint. But every other day, I'd, you know, catch the Eurostar to, to Paris and have a lesson with um, someone like Christian Wirth or Gilles Tresseau, or I'd spend the day watching Claude's class, um, <coughs> trying saxophones at some with Joe, you know, terrible things mm-hmm. like that. I was also very lucky that uh, London Saxophone Week was on when I was there, so to see David Du Masterclasses, Formo Du Masterclasses, mm. a bunch of um, performances by the leading English players and the, and the French guests. I saw Arno do a masterclass at the Royal College too. Um, yeah, so that was that that trip. And then the next trip I divided into kind of oh, three locations where I did um, an intensive week in Amsterdam um, mm-hmm. where I just, um, got into seeing Arno teach, but also had the, the great um, fortune of meeting up with Niels and seeing Niels play with orchestra in Den Haag on the coldest night of my life. Um, <laughs> I won't forget, like it was minus seven and Niels was just laughing at me because I was dying and um, now I have to laugh at him in Australian summers. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then 
a week with Jay down in, in Porto and getting lessons off um, Fernando Ramos and, and Hank mm-hmm. and then going and spending a week in Bordeaux with um, Benny and meeting people like Josh Hyde and stuff and learning off NBC and, and doing that eight hours practice a day. Um, it was a fantastic experience and time. So, mm. um, yeah, uh, those were the kind of overseas people I learnt off and... Um, yeah, it's about, I suppose it's just getting different viewpoints. Mm. And um, Michael Duke will tell you this, is quite often people are saying the same thing, just explaining it in a different way. And um, some of those people I mentioned explain things beautifully. Um, I still use uh, terms that Jean-Denis Michat used in that gap lesson in my teaching every day, because I think he just explained it in a way that's so simple that people just grasp straight away. Um, someone like Gilles from Habanera, his um, combination of technique and music art at the same time is something that's resonated dearly with me. Um, I really wanted to to actually study with Gilles. Um, unfortunately, that didn't work out, but that's that's kind of life, you know. Um, mm. but yeah, I had a um, wonderful time and was lucky to be able to have lessons with all those people. Yeah, yeah. we certainly. Um got a uh, smorgasbord of um, <laughs> educators um, and you know it's certainly um, as you say like having some different perspectives and things like that and the the, the un- one of the unique things about you is that you have this almost photographic memory so your ability to sort of capture that information and retain it for years um, like you know there's things that you bring up every now and again that sort of like we've all forgotten which was like 30 years ago like what we had for breakfast or whatever so you know all those different lessons and things like you know there's a lot of wealth of information and yeah look if any of you guys want to get in touch with Andrew about any of that stuff please do because as I said you know, he go verbatim what would happen in those sessions um, but sort of rounding up the your education and uh, the things you've learnt and stuff um, was there a particular I, I think you've already touched base on this um, and sort of answered this question but you can elaborate uh, was there a particular lesson or an experience um, that really resonated with you um, I, I mean you, your lesson with Michette obviously had quite an impact and uh, the, the experiences in Gap but was there anything else that sort of comes to mind and if so why why is it still sort of um, prominent for you now yeah, so um, I'm a firm believer in that um, if you can take one thing away from every lesson you have or masterclass you attend, it's been a success. Like if there's one point you can get from it, you go, oh, hang on, that's that's something that I can use or something I can work on. Um, so I, I quite often use this example to students. I um, Years ago, there was a... A German youth orchestra coming through Sydney and there was a guy attached to it um, and he ended up doing it some, for some reason he managed to like I was teaching at Newtown and we, we got him to do a master class at Newtown mm-hmm. and he played with the student quartet and he just was not very good at all like <laughs> he was quite terrible I didn't rate his playing in the slightest but then he gave the master class and he talked about with one of the kids this concept of um, the concept of musicality through rhythm like so often we think about the musicality coming from the, the melodic line or our vibrato or the dynamics. And he's just talking about the importance of how we can get musicality from highlighting the rhythm. I'm just like, boom, you know, and there you go. Someone who was playing may not have been the greatest, you know, but there was that one point that I, I, I took away and I've regularly used in my own playing and teaching since. I think it's a wonderful concept. Um, so I think the importance um, of being able to take away one thing from every, every event um, particular moments like I've touched on the Meshat lessons um, Gilles Tressos Christian Verf I, there's a couple of lessons of Gilles and um, Christian that were massive for me because I suppose like after undergrad I moved out of home moved in a place in Summer Hill with um, Ben Kerry Nick Kerry Tristan and Lachlan and we, we practiced lots and I, I, back then you could af- afford to teach a few days a week and practice heaps and heaps Mm. Uh, the students can't really do that anymore but I could at the time so I did and I went and had these lessons um, you know sleeping on Jay's floor and then I then had the time to put those you know the points they gave me in those um, couple of lessons I had with them into detailed work for about six months you know and it's things like that because like, the concepts that some of the concepts they wanted me to work on weren't going to happen overnight they actually needed some detailed focused work and I suppose that 
I could say that those lessons really resonated with me because I got to really like steadily apply them. Um, so yeah, that's what, th those are the moments, but the moments aren't restricted to teaching, I suppose. Like it, it's things like recordings, it's, um, and it's concerts, to, um, concerts too, mm. you know? Um, for me, like one of the biggest moments was, um, again, you and I had that, you know, high school pre-internet age where um, we listened to CDs and CDs were really expensive, like $30 a hit for a CD. So like you listen to it a hundred thousand times and like I'd worn my CD collection out by the time I got to uni and then you go into the uni and the, the first thing I saw was like this massive library full of CDs. I'm just like, oh, this is the best thing ever. Like I just remember like going to the jazz section and going, A and just starting working my way through. <laughs> um, yeah, it was just, you know, things like that, just being able to really throw yourself into listening with recordings and, and concerts as well. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that's interesting. Now, um, going on with that, um, yeah, like, you know, uh, like many people of our age, we uh, certainly had a, uh, a collection of CDs and, you know, the people before us had collections of LPs and cassette tapes. Yeah. Um, for you, who were um, some of your, or who are actually, uh, your biggest musical influences and why? Well, I think like you, mine are pretty diverse. And uh, yeah. I think some people don't know this necessarily about me. Um, I, like, I'm, I'm a massive jazz fan. I just, I'm kind of mad about it. Um, and I think my first big saxophone hero was Rick Robertson from Dig. Mm. Like my, my, Michael Walker, my teacher said, oh, there's this group you have to listen to. And like at the time they were on Triple J and it was being used to everything. And I got the CD and I thought, oh, this is fantastic. So like, I, I, I know Rick solos from all that dig stuff better than Rick does for sure. <laughs> like, you know, it inside out, every note, um, but also the inflection on the note because you've listened to it that many times. Um, so Rick Robertson was like my first big saxophone hero. Um, and like, he was massive for me during high school. I listened to lots of other people. I then got it, you know, I was very lucky to, James Nightingale was teaching the saxophone ensemble at my high school. So I got exposed mm -hmm. to Jim and, and Continuum through that. And again, I burned a hole in their CD and Jim's Drive CD. Um, and one of the teachers got a really good jazz collection in for the high school when I was there. So I listened to a lot of Weather Report and the early Miles Davis quintets. Um, but then you, know, you said we got to the con and there's that big jazz section. It was alphabetical. And I, I started working my way through and I, I got to B. I pulled out this CD and it said Michael Brecker. I'm like, oh, I've heard of this guy. I, I probably should give a listen to this one. And I, I went into one of those little booths and it was Timers of the Essence. And I put, I just pressed play on the first track. And after about 30 seconds, my jaw just hit the floor and it's never really got back up. <laughs> um, I don't think with Brecker. Brecker is my absolute musical hero, I think. Um, if I could play saxophone like anyone to be like him, um, which is bizarre coming from a classical saxophonist, I know. But I just I love everything about his um, his playing. I suppose another big hero from that jazz realm too, a very different style is, is Paul Desmond. I love Paul Desmond's playing just because the sound is just incredible and every note's perfect. Like it's mm. just, his solos just sound like yeah, just melodies, heads, you know. Um, very different, you know, in contrast to Brecker, but yeah, I love both of them. Um, from the classical sphere during that, those uni days, I, well, I listened to heaps, but obviously like Claude and Arno were massive. Um, Claude, just the most amazing technical recordings and incredible music. Arno, that sound just enchanted me. And I think um, both of us agree when we first heard the Habanera Quartet and got access to their CDs, um, that was life changing. You're like, oh my goodness. Um, so yeah, the Christian Jules and the Capizio, um Co. That was just, um, they were real big moments for me um but it's and that, i suppose like there have been heroes along the way but it's there's been countless like it's any cd that you've listened to lots you know i could I can name hundreds of cds that i've listened to hundreds of times in the saxophone realm um and they've all played an important role mm. um so yeah but those are probably some of the, the big markers so to speak okay and uh, for our audience, we should probably also make a mention that Andrew has actually recently got onto Spotify 
and has even um, broadened his uh, listening palette uh, more um, with the access of that. So, um, yeah, oh. looking forward to touching base on some listening that you catch up on during the holidays. Oh, look, yeah, it's, it's, um, I know it's the devil for musicians, but um, mm. I've discovered a whole lot of stuff that I hadn't had access to and some new people um, that, you know, I'm not going to find on the internet. Um, like, I'm, I'm pretty spellbound by Baptiste Dubon at the moment. That guy is just like... He's, he's on a phenomenal. Planet. Like, <laughs> he's totally on a different planet. And um, so my girls have been subjected to him, but also I've been giving them a good dose of um, like a wide variety of things. It's been really good actually to check out um, a whole lot of like, like people like Timothy McAllister, his, um, his catalogue, but also even just listening to CDs that I already have, but it's mm. just on Spotify, it's just easy. It's just like, oh, okay, I'm making a girl's breakfast. I'm going to press play on a particular artist. I have all those CDs there. But then you just get this random selection of, you know, someone like Claude or Arno. It's, it's awesome. So, yeah. yeah. Nice. And I am kind of um, enjoying it a little bit, even though as a musician, it kind of makes me sad. So Yeah, okay. I think it's sort of, as you say, it is the uh, the spawn of the devil for musicians. But uh, yes. anyway, uh, we don't get political on this show. Um, so uh, going on, uh, uh, we're going to be talking about your, your playing career now. Now, um, we will be getting to your uh, chain music stuff like, uh, you know, a certain saxophone quartet you play with and some of your freelancer work and stuff. But just before we get into that, I want to talk about maybe some of the, the early opportunities that you had um, uh, like say, you know, fresh out of uh, your undergraduate or, you know, just before you started uh, going into, you know, things like chronology arts and, um, I mean, Nexus has always been a bit ongoing, but, you know, you've had experiences freelancing with orchestras and things like that. But um, sort of in the early days, like in terms of uh, finding opportunities for yourself, did you create opportunities for yourself or were you asked to be involved? Like sort of maybe talk us through how some of those opportunities came about. Yeah, so um, I think and you what and they I were, both, sorry. Um, when we first um, finished our undergrad, we are, I've got a guest now. I've got a... Oh. Sneaking through the yeah, put stuff away. All yes. good. <laughs> we'll wave the camera, Snay. Hi. <laughs> yeah, Snay's been out, and I've actually been at home with the girls. Um, hang on a sec. There we go. There'll be no more interruption. Okay. All good. This wasn't, you know, the the, the toddler coming in. Oh, that's sneaky. No, I was trying to be good. No, no, nothing. Um, else. I've already got water. Um, so. Look, I think, yeah, when you and I finished undergrad, we were both of the opinion that we didn't be, we didn't want to be those kind of players that finished their undergrad and then just disappeared. I think that happens a lot. You see people that just get stuck in teaching because they need to make some money and they end up stop playing or performing. So um, we tried to create some opportunities. Um, one of the first things we did, I remember, I actually got a flashback to the other day because we were driving through Erskine, where you and I did a theatre production. Where oh we yes. We wrote all the music for it slash improvised, um, and performed it with the theatre production, and um, it may not have been the best idea, but that kind of shows that we were trying really hard to um, to make sure we continued playing and performing, um, and looking for opportunities outside of that educational institution. Um, so we did things like that. We organised duo concerts um, because Jay had moved to the UK. Um, I was very fortunate too to be um, given a run in a few of the, the youth orchestras in Sydney. Mm -hmm. um, we played with um, cause, yeah, it was one of those. One, it was a weird one where the at the time the wind players were always old and the string players were young. So you'd have like the wind players end of uni, early career, and then the string players would be like early uni or high school. But like, I played with SBS just after I finished. Um, uni and got mm -hmm. to do a few of the orchestral solos with them like the first one I did was Old Castle and got to do a heap of concerts with them actually which was really good also got to do Sydney Sinfonia which sadly doesn't exist anymore um, for those people that are not of my generation or older um, it kind of got turned into fellowship so we now have the fellowship but before that uh, Sinfonia was like a it was a professional training orchestra that met four times a year or so and it was audition based and people all around the country were auditioned for it and it was paid and you'd come to Sydney for an intensive week and you'd work with um, someone and, and put on a concert and things so I was lucky enough to work with uh, the young Yavi and Richard Gill and things and do West Side Stories and do Romeo and Juliet with them um, 
I think tragically I was the first and only person that ever got to play saxophone with Symphonia. Because you imagine it's not always in the repertoire. Yeah. And tragically it doesn't exist anymore, but like we got to do things in the Opera House with them with some of our um, colleagues and that was, that was pretty cool. Um, so <coughs> some opportunities that came my way, but others that we tried to create for ourselves, the, I suppose the combination, but mm. trying to make sure that I suppose after uni, it, it was there's a few things. It was trying to create opportunities, but for me, it was trying to fix some of my flaws. Like, I distinctly remember sitting down and listening to my final recital and going, okay, um, these are the things I really liked from it, but the things I really didn't like were my tone and my intonation. And I set about working on that really hard for the next 12 to 24 months. Um, and that was something that you might, my housemates will tell you about the hours I spent doing long notes and exercise mechanic and, and hmm. stuff like that. <laughs> um, and Tristan Locke still joke about it um, but that was something that was really um, important for me and um, paid massive dividends I think nice um, what um, sort of having experienced um, you know uh, sort of coming out of that uh, you know being a recent graduate and you know sort of having a, a mixture of you know opportunities given <coughs> to you as well as opportunities you created what advice would you give to younger musicians or recent graduates looking to start off a career in music in terms of, um, you know, as you say, like, uh, you can't always wait for the phone to ring. You have to create your own opportunities, be proactive. So what sort of things would you recommend for those type of players? Well, I think that's a really good point. Yeah, the, the, you, um, you can't wait for the phone to ring because it won't ring. Mm. Um, we're living in a funny age with COVID, but COVID aside, I would have said, go to concerts, all the concerts, like all the concerts of your instrument, of your um, your teachers, of your people in your sphere, but all just concerts in general. Um, you know, if, if I'm booking someone these days for something, I got a call for um, to rec me to recommend someone for some teaching work the other day. And I'm going to recommend the people I know are dead keen. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not going to recommend the people that, oh yeah, they they were good at uni, but I haven't heard or seen anything of them for the last few years. You know, where what happened to them? Where they go? I don't know. Um, I'm going to recommend the people I know are dead keen, and those are the people that I see going to concerts. Um, people that I know have a really good attitude and work really hard. You know, um, as I said, I finished fourth year, and then spent the next year moving out of home practicing hours a day trying to work on my floors um that's not something every recent graduate does mm. there are certain ones that really do it and it's wonderful they go, okay I, I really know i'm now not constricted by recitals as well i need to work on <coughs> so um i think people are gonna if you people want to book people that are keen that are hard working they don't want to be a part of the scene they want to be involved in the music making they have a really good work ethic um there's always going to be someone that will work harder than you, so you can't be you can't be slack. So whether that that's hard practice or as you say, like creating opportunities, because um, people aren't going to call you if they're not seeing you or hearing of you. Mm. So sometimes that can feel like flogging a dead horse or playing to you know it might feel like small audiences, um, but it's a slow process um, and. I look at one of my um, my former students. I think is doing fantastic things as a conductor now. Is Sam Weller. Um, Sam wanted opportunities to conduct, so he created his own orchestra. Mm. You no, know, ta da! Um, that orchestra is now going great. Yeah. Sam has had wonderful things happen in his conducting career. One of the things that helped him do that was getting the experience by conducting his own orchestra. Like that's a pretty extreme example, mm. but um, you've got to you've got to create things. Mm. All right, no, it's uh, really insightful. Now, um, uh, sort of going back to uh, your own career, uh, and you know, I, being a collaborative musician and a chain musician is certainly at the fore of what you do, um, and uh, quite obviously, probably one of the most important musical outlets for you is the Nexus Quartet. 
Um, not trying to <coughs> big up us in any way, but you know, I'd, I I would certainly say that for myself as well. Um, but with the the next quartet, uh, it'd be interesting to hear your perspective on things because, um, as I said, you you kind of got this really photographic memory, and I'm sure the rest of us have a little bit of a hazy recollection of how it all came about. But um, yeah, maybe sort of t talk us through how how the group sort of came about and how it's evolved over the last I think it's twenty years now. Eighteen. Eighteen. Almost twenty now. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Formed in two thousand and two. So it's um. Yeah, like like so many groups, I suppose, in that early tertiary stage, like happenstance. Like as you said, Mark Walton just said, "You for a quartet, and you for a quartet," and that's how we started. Um, and we started like that. Um, we did a lot of experimentation, swapping around saxophones in the early days, which was um, cause people ask us, "Do we ever swap?" And we don't anymore, but. In those early days, we did, but at the same time, we were swapping around. But we had, we had lots of performance opportunities again because of Mark and David. Um, so all of a sudden, it just seemed part of our regular education. Okay, um, and the course has changed a lot since then too. Um, we didn't really do, we, we didn't do wind band, like yeah. um, the wind band now at the Sydney Con is fantastic. Sounds awesome, but. When we were students, it was considered something for the, um, more for the education majors. Mm -hmm. So they gave us the option, because we weren't going to be an orchestra, we could do more quartet or wind band. We're like, we'll do more quartet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that was, um, that was, I think, really important. That kind of, you know, getting these opportunities through David, um, not just through David, like, I remember doing recordings and all kinds of things. Um, they were really... All of a sudden, getting to hear yourself on Sandy again back then, you know, we didn't have recording devices on our phone. So yeah. you actually hear yourself back externally go, oh, wow, that's what I sound like. Um, so, really important learning experiences like that. Um, so, our evolution, I suppose, um, that's it. that was how we started. Like, like most groups, it's like a uni quartet, but I suppose we were just fortunate that we got tremendous ex performance experience, we did all those performances. and again if you want opportunities before your way you, you perform the more you perform the more you get asked to do things so then we'd be working with composers we'd be working um with like the good string quartet doing concerts I remember having Stephen Yates write us that lovely octet with us mm. in Greenway um wonderful wonderful things like that I suppose what happened too we all became like pretty quickly great mates and that made it really easy and that always meant that there was um a drive to push forward with it so even with like Jay going overseas, um, as soon as he was back, we we're like, yes, okay, let's let's do this. Let's um, let's go playing. So even when Benny went to do Bordeaux, like Nick Rossignolo slotted in. Um, so there was that period of time when people were studying overseas, where our lineup was that little bit flexy, but there was always that sense of oh, we're, we're still going forward. And then when we we're all finally in the same country, we kind of got a move on, got serious into competitions and doing our own concerts and things and taking the standard up and um, that was going really well. Um, then Benny decided to put his focus into electronic music, mm -hmm. you know, and he's composing. Um, and it was really great that he made the call at that stage, said, look, I'm going to take a step back from playing. And that was wonderful. Then all of a sudden it opened the door and um, installed in Michael Duke. And Michael's been fantastic for the quartet and like really helping us take it to that next stage with um, professionalism, our opportunities, our ideas. Um, and then expanding from there, like working really hard, trying to become a really good quartet, and then opening up our avenues by working with other artists, mm. um, creating more opportunities everywhere. I don't know if I'm even answering your question anymore. No, 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 that's okay. Um, the origin of it. No, 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 it's just sort of, yeah, the origin of the quartet, but I think, yeah, that probably covers, covers enough of it. Um, uh, now, just the artistic direction of Nexus. Now, this is an interesting one because we... Um, I'm, I'm trying not to answer the question for you, but just in terms of like what we do, it's certainly uh, a mixed bag, I'd certainly mm -hmm. say. Um, there was a time there that we, and we still do, um, one of the things we really love to do is doing collaborations with other artists, and that sort of really drives mm -hmm. things. Um, but maybe you can sort of talk us through sort of what what we do, basically. So creatively, I suppose in, in choosing a program, um, we throw ideas at each other. Like quite often we workshop ideas independently for a concert mm. and then go, 
hey boys, what do you think about X? And everyone goes, yeah, nah, or oh yeah, sounds great. So it's not like the four of us are sitting down and, and making programs. Like quite often, particular programs have the distinct imprint of certain members of the quartet. Um, you know, when we did the, the Juliet letters with Nikki Grayson, that was all yours. You know, that was your, um, your idea, your connection with her, all your arranging. Um, and certain concerts have had uh, more distinct imprints than others. Um, like the one we did with Emily on Harp last week, mm -hmm. I mentioned at the time that was something that I got really inspired by from hearing Aurelia do with Harp when I was visiting Jay in 2006. Right. So, like, um, it's quite often just the workshop where we, we try to put forward our own ideas and people might have, oh, yeah, that's great. How about we include X or, yeah, oh, this is, you know, so it's, yeah. It's a group decision, but it's quite often with individual stamps, different projects. Mm, yeah, for sure. I would say. Yeah, yeah. There's and no, uh, there's no artistic leader. There's no kind of yeah, particular. It's, it's all kind of um. It's quite democratic, really. It's quite, and I think that's helpful too. Um, yeah. Because we that... all feel like we have a, an ownership of the ensemble. It's if there's one person running like a, a piano trio, for instance, mm -hmm. and they're making all the artistic choices, um, it's becomes theirs rather than the ensembles so um i think we're quite good we all feel we have an ownership of the ensemble because not only are we all playing together but we're all making artistic decisions yeah um, yeah um no it's certainly an important thing to mention i think a lot of people are um yeah may not be aware of that but yeah it is sort of like a musical democracy um yeah uh now uh we also uh, are active in terms of commissioning works and um we uh have previously released an album of all new music and that was sort of a combination of different projects that were involved in and different commissions and um just sort of talking about the commissioning process in terms of how like as that group goes how we go about it um uh like what sort of uh, what's your recollection on sort of the things that um we do in order of getting works written like uh you know we have connections with composers and we ask them and things like that yeah, look, it's, it's a real mixed bag i suppose isn't it because i i feel like um quite often we've approached composers mm -hmm. um quite often composers have approached us yeah um quite often particular events have gone oh, okay we'll put you two together and it's been kind of done like that as well um yeah, it's, it's been a real mixed bag. We've um, directly approached people. People have approached us and um, organisations have, have teed things up too. It's kind of been an interesting mix like that. Um, one of the great um, travesties, I feel, is we don't have the, an awesome stream of money to commission all the people we'd like to. Um, mm. We're not going to win arts grants and um, we'd have to find funding elsewhere. And we, we, we are trying in that in certain areas, but I, I'd love to have some awesome stream of money to just get all the people I want to write works to write them. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's, it, that's a challenge, I suppose. Um, and that's something that we have to look at moving forward and Australian music in general, um, how, to, how to commission our own um, composers so that they're getting some financial compensation for all their work too. Yeah, um, we we mentioned it here, but one of the things I um I think was quite formative in my uh, building connections, but also my, my own training was the chronology arts. So, people who don't know what chronology arts was, it was initially an initiative to get emerging Australian composers to have their their works performed, and it just kind of started as a mismatch of all different kind of players. And then after a while, um, the two guys that organised it realised, oh, we well, hang on, we we keep on asking the same kind of players to play all the time. We, we should form a core ensemble. And so there's a core ensemble of um, saxophone, flute, clarinet, viola, cello, and, and, and eventually piano. And I was the, obviously the saxophone player. And that was great for me, learning to play chamber music with other non-saxophone instruments, like learning to play really soft to play with the strings and articulate with them. And, but also working with all these Australian composers, um, some of who were personal friends from Sydney Combat, some from other states that I've never met, but you get their music and learning all different styles and techniques and things. So that was um, wonderful for me because it, it built up connections that have continued since. Like people like Cyrus, I didn't know Cyrus till chronology. Mm. I didn't know him during our undergrad days. Um, 
you know, people who I, I knew, but the relationship got strengthened. Like I knew Lachlan Skipworth through Masters, but got to know him more through Canology too. Um, so these kind of um, combinations that was helpful in developing the contacts with the composers was important, workshopping their music and performing it. But also one of the things that was cool about, because they were emerging, a kind of one of the cool things that composers got was their work played. You know, because yeah. so many young composers will write and not get something played. Um, but then for the composer, it's spending the time writing, getting some financial remuneration, as well as a performance. You know, these are the challenges they face too. Yeah. No worries, Jay. See you soon, mate. Have a All right. And... See you, Jay. Sorry, for those <laughs> that, I don't know if they can see that on the feed. No. Jay's go. <laughs> yeah, Jay's going to check out. Um, okay, so going on, um, uh, just one final question with Nexus. Do you have a particular concert highlight with the group? Yeah, look, um, I'm not a favourites person. Like, <laughs> I don't have a favourite colour. I don't have a favourite drink. I don't have a, you know... I like lots of different things. And it's really funny. Like, I I have lots of favourite concerts. Um, and it might be like when we were in third year and um, played in Mudgy in that um, restaurant. Because I just... Um, like we, we did a gig in, when we were in third year where we did a whole lot of concerts in Mudgy. And one in a particular night was at a restaurant. Three courses um, with local food and wine. We did three sets, class, uh, like classical tango jazz. And I just loved that night because I was sitting there just feeling like I was doing what I wanted to do. Like I was in a room with a beautiful acoustic playing for music with great mates and the crowd was loving it. And I just went, oh, this is, you know, this is kind of it, isn't it? You know, so that's a third year concert. That's not like the amazing ones I've had. Like, you know, I, I think about like playing Melbourne Recital Center for their birthday to like mm. a sold out house, live broadcast on ABC like that. That's also pretty cool. Yeah. Australian Festival of Chamber Music, whether it be on like an island on the Barrier Reef or playing in the Conversations one, like Matthew Heinsohn's music with Matthew there in front of like a beautiful audience of like people who are, you know, coming to this massive, important festival. Um, whether it be World Saxophone Congress is playing Atlantis music and having Apollo sitting in the front row, mm. you know, or um, whether it be any of our concerts we've done in our concert series or, or over the years, I just... Yeah, lots of them, essentially. Um, lots of memories stick out. Yeah, I'm not a stickler for one big moment, but like, but lots of moments. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Now, uh, going on, uh, discussing uh, some of your other projects, uh, I know we sort of harped on about Nexus a bit, but as you had mentioned, you know, things like Chronology Arts, mm -hmm. um, uh, your collaborations uh, with uh, Emily Granger and Mark Olivero and whatnot, maybe you could talk us through some of those other projects. Um, I, I know you sort of touched base, but maybe elaborate a little bit more on maybe a couple of key groups that you've worked with over the years. Okay, so yeah, I think besides like Nexus aside, <coughs> The most important one was Chronology Arts mm -hmm. um, because we rehearsed regularly as an ensemble, um, doing lots of new music. Um, we were all young and energetic. We were all kind of postgraduate level students and um, trying to f find our way in the big wide world. Um, and we did heaps of concerts and heaps of music. And I've still got like the folders of music here and bunches of the recordings. And uh, that was a really good learning process for me um, as I mentioned, but also because I got so many, like, we recorded everything too, so I got to really analyse my own playing and how it sounded in the ensemble and and those kind of things too. Um, as I mentioned, that opened up doors for for working with composers. Um, someone like Mark, I worked with Mark through Chronology, but as I said, that relationship extended back to high school. Um, so that's yeah, it's a long term relationship now. Where we've been working for over twenty years and. Um, I've done yeah most of his saxophone works, um, but he also kind of started that ensemble mongrel, which was actually initially with Alicia Crosley and myself, and it was all his music and like two wind instruments and live interactive electronics and and screens in the background and stuff. And where um, I'm still doing stuff with Mark, um, mm -hmm. I was doing stuff with him two weeks ago, and we're doing stuff more stuff with him next year. Um, I form relationships yeah, from undergrad with someone like Paul Castle. So I recorded Paul's um, sax parts for a musical theatre work um, based on Bigfoot. Like, right. big, he's doing the Bigfoot Hunter um, <laughs> the other week. Um, you know, so I've worked on and off with Paul now for, you know, since like 2003 or four. Um, you know, these are 
Um, the relationship I've had with Cyrus now, like Cyrus has written me a, a number of works and I've also done his ensemble works. So I've done his, um, his ballet Clash a number of times mm -hmm. and his ensemble music too, which is, um, I really like. And we had the, well, I had the, the pleasure of last year recording his four pieces for soprano and got put on, on vinyl. So I've, um, got my vinyl print, um, and I have to catch up with Cyrus next week. Um, so that was a wonderful experience, you know, recording the composer's music with him and getting it on the vinyl and, um. I've done a lot of performances with Cyrus now, um, and a lot of his music, and it's been yeah, it's wonderful working with living composers on their on their music and presenting it in different formats. Someone like Cyrus, whether it be concert style or, or ballet. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you mentioned that like I've, I've played with Spruzzi a few times because Elle and I have such a great relationship that was formed yeah. out of the um, our time playing in chronology together. So I want to do cello works with cello, sax and cello, and they've been duets, but also larger ensemble pieces. Um, but like, yeah, lots of chamber music that have stemmed from me playing in different groups, whether it be more, more traditional or cutting edge. Um, some of those connections have gone into to film as well and mm -hmm. to TV series, um, or you know, like some of those connections um, uh, yeah, have resulted in yeah lots of different avenues. So yeah, yeah. Nice. So, yeah, you certainly get around and, you know, you're extremely active on the scene. Um, and, you know, I'm sure, you know, there's like every, you know, second or third chamber group out there, at least pre-COVID, um, you were associated with it in some shape or form. But you have also been quite active online with a lot of these people as well. So, um, yeah, it's great to still see that still continuing on, even in these trying times, for sure. Um, now... Another group you've worked with uh, was, in fact, uh, Sydney's own symphony orchestra, the Sydney Symphony Orchestra, the original name. Um, and you have performed uh, numerous times with these uh, fine musicians and uh, performed an array and contrasting uh, types of programs with this ensemble. Um, do you have a particular highlight with your time with the orchestra in terms of a, a concert that you enjoyed playing? Oh, look, there are a few. Um... I suppose, like, um, the few that spring to mind normally involve solos, like, surprise, surprise. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the first ones for me that stuck out was we did um, Duke Ellington's Harlem, and there was a big tenor saxophone solo in that. Like, it's actually like a cadenza, and then the strings come underneath you. And I had that, and that was big for me um, for a couple of reasons. It was my first big solo with the orchestra but it was also big for me because I was actually feeling a bit crap about my playing just beforehand um, I didn't feel very secure um, I wasn't really confident in read choice like I was experimenting with a different um, type of read like the V12s had just come out in tenor mm -hmm. oh yeah I'd love this and it, it wasn't sounding good the blue box wasn't sounding good I'm just like oh I didn't know what to do and so I was kind of like oh you know the blue box were good before this you know and um and then I also felt like I really nailed the solo every time we played it. And that's a good feeling. And I got lots of really good compliments from other players in the orchestra and the conductor. Um, had a huge big dirty gliss in it, which I nailed really well. So that was <laughs> kind of nice. Um, I love doing the Shostakovich solos with them when we did the, um, the jazz suites. Mm -hmm. Again, that was um, a great experience because you got the solo, but it was a great experience in a different way. So I practiced it really hard. I learned it. And then the conductor took it at half the speed of all the recordings. So I had to kind of throw out my preconceptions in the window and, and readjust. Um, the Natalie Cole one was a big one for me, I suppose, because we got to, um, Natalie Cole came out and played with the Sydney Symphony. And as I said, my my dad's, like, he's a school teacher. He's not a, a trained musician, but like at home, we owned the recording of her singing Unforgettable with her dad. Mm -hmm. you know, and then for me to be on stage playing it with her and there was the recording of him behind it, like that was kind of a big moment for me, not because it was the, the greatest solo with the orchestra or anything, but it was like, kind of my dad was like, oh, that's that's really cool. Like in my mind, I kind of, in front of my dad, I kind of made it at that point, if that makes sense. Mm. So that was big. Um, and one where I didn't really have much of a solo, but like, we got to play with Ben Folds and like Ben Folds is about one of my favorite artists in high school. So playing with Ben Folds was very cool. Yeah, Just to meet him and say, oh, I'm such a big fan, you know, and then play on stage with him. I thought that was really cool too. 
Um, so like, obviously, like you know, the solos in the orchestra have been great. Yep. But I'd I'd add the um, yeah, the, just the two pop ones. One just for you know making it in your parents' eyes, I suppose. Well, not that they hadn't thought I'd made it before then, but that was that was nice, I think. Yeah, yeah. And um, just playing with an idol. Yeah. Mm, nice. Um, now, uh, just. Uh, like for a saxophone player who might be you know have have the good fortune to uh work with an orchestra you know m might be a student ensemble or you know one day have the opportunity to work with you know a world-class orchestra or something like that saxophones um are, don't necessarily get regular training in this field but what sort of tips and tricks could you share for a saxophone player looking to prepare um for a part uh, playing in an orchestra that, that's a really good question and it's a funny one because I think I've kind of touched on it. I feel very fortunate that I did actually kind of get training in it, which is really uncommon. Like, I got to play mm. with an orchestra in high school. So yep. I got to play with SYR. I got to play with SBS. I got to play with CD Symphonia. Then another big training one for me was I got to play with Wollongong Symphony for a number of years, um, which was paid. Like, back then it was um, $100 a call and we did the rehearsals and you did a couple of gigs and I... I got to do a heap. The composer was obsessed with pieces that had saxophone solos in it. <laughs> so I learned to play, I got paid to play with a, like a quite a competent orchestra. Like back then, $100 a call was not Pretty good. too much less than, it was 150 for SSO. That was yeah, 100. yeah. Um, back then. Um, and so I was very lucky that I kind of had that training that most saxophone players don't get because you're kind of like, okay, you've gone through oh, we need a saxophone, and you, all of a sudden you're 24 and you haven't really played with an orchestra and you've got to play pictures or something. Hmm. Um, so I feel fortunate that I had the experience. Um, but I think, you know, it's you have to know your part inside out, like inside out, like um, particularly if it's a small part and it's a solo. Like you don't need the music. Like you hmm. have to know your solo from memory. Um just so you can adapt and shift to whatever happens because um it's different for us because we're not playing in the orchestra each week mm. and as you know yourself playing in a full-time like wind band um it's a really different kettle of fish and different ensembles are different so i think um one of the main things aren't they? you know when you're young you learn about following the conductor and everything is here and it's there and then you go and play with a professional orchestra and it's just not. Yeah. <laughs> um, because at the opera house, there's time delay. And if you come in there, you'll come in early. So like you've, um, you've got to use your ears. You just mm. got to listen, 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 listen to those around you, listen to the percussion, look at the first violins, both. It's about just using your ears and adapting to where the tempo is within the ensemble um, for rhythmic purposes, but also pitch, you know, mm. where, where do you have to sit? Where does the orchestra sit? Or where does this particular orchestra sit? Because they don't all sit at the same pitch or the same large ensemble. Some sit higher, some sit lower. So it's about um, knowing your part inside out, being over-prepared. Um, you know, it's different if you've got a full-time gig in the orchestra and you can sight read that week's score. But when we're coming in as casuals and um, if you do a crap job, they shouldn't want you back should they so yeah um being super prepared knowing your part well but most importantly using your ears mm. and you say that th that's probably an applicable approach to any sort of ensemble playing well for any ensemble yeah like yeah. you've got to know your part you've got to be confident you've got to have good rhythmic skills um and you've got to use your ears mm. um you know i i heard the i went to a, a clarinet master class once and paul dean uh, the really good clarinetist from Brisbane. Yeah, yeah. Um, was saying that on a panel, the first thing you look for in an orchestral audition is rhythm. The second thing you look at is rhythm. The third thing you look at is rhythm. And the fourth thing you look at is their intonation. You know, and um, <clears throat> so often people get carried away in the nuance of their little excerpt. And they, if you're not nailing the rhythm, people aren't going to want to play with you. Yeah. If your pitch isn't in the ballpark, people aren't going to want to play with you. Um, yeah. So. Think that's important mm -hmm. no fair enough um now in uh i mean we've kind of touched base on a lot of your performance things but you know you also perform uh, as a soloist as well um you've given a few solo recitals uh here there and everywhere uh notably you know the melbourne international saxophone festival uh, a couple other conferences and um also uh online and 
recently and yeah uh, uh what is there any sort of notable uh solo performances that you can recollect in terms of um being enjoyable or having a good experience working on the music or just good music to play yeah look <laughs> again again i, I, I know yeah yeah i don't do favorites um because i think with the sum of our experiences like i really think that as a musician i'm i'm here because of every little performance i've done um solo is something that yeah look i've i've had lots of them and and some like just now just thinking back all of a sudden i know we, we talked about a bunch of new music today so some of them come back like doing mark stuff or or doing cyrus's stuff um you know, doing featured recitals, it's all very nice. Um, I, I think sometimes, like, for me, doing a fantastic job of, like, the composer's music with them in the room or playing has always been special. Not if it's for, like... It's sometimes, yeah, look, sometimes it's lovely to play for a big audience and then sometimes it's lovely to play for a small audience and do a great job. Um, yeah. So... Yeah, solo is lonely, but you learn a lot about yourself too, I suppose. Um, yeah, particular experiences. Like, yeah, I'm, like I'm just thinking, like, even just with Cyrus, as I said, I've done his outer work about, I don't know, six times. And I remember once doing it in Wollongong at a gallery function where heaps of people. But more importantly than that, we just we played it really well that day. And it was one of those ones where sometimes you wish every performance you did was recorded because some days you just, like, you nail it. And this is why I try to explain to students that you should record everything because I think some of my best recordings, my best performances, um, particularly solo, haven't been recorded. Yeah, right. So I don't have that back catalogue of, oh, listen to me do X because it wasn't as easy, I suppose, when we were younger. Mm -hmm. um, but even now, I'm, I probably should do it more often just record everything. Um, so I have it there. Music's kind of going the opposite way now. Like, because we can't play in front of people, like, everything's recorded. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I struggle to think of like particular moments. Like, it's always nice playing at those congresses and things. And I, you know, I um, remember you and I sharing the stage with Claude DeLong in, in Scotland. Like, that was pretty cool. Um, yeah, and Londex was in the audience. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but as I said, it's not necessarily even about the big occasion. It's just um, playing to people that are really enjoying it um, mm. or just you feeling like you're doing a really good job too. Yeah. All right. No, it's a very uh, diplomatic answer, Andrew. Thank you. Um, now, moving along, uh, a few people should know this, but if they don't, um, I don't blame them, but you also moonlight as a wonderful arranger. Um, and I know with the Nexus Quartet, we have done uh, several of your arrangements over the years, um, and most recently uh, your arrangements of Debussy, uh, that we did with Emily last week, in fact, um, in Sydney here for that concert. Um, and uh, you also uh, dabble in composing as well. Uh, and uh, you have a couple of pieces available on your website for a free download, a couple of etudes and a solo piece. Um, uh, the solo piece, I believe, was originally written for uh, our good friend Jay on the baritone saxophone. Um, but talking about the, the arranging side of things, um, what are some like arranging projects uh, that you've sort of really enjoyed um, working on in terms of seeing the end result and going, oh yeah, that's that's really nice or even better than the original? Yeah, look, um, I quite like arranging. It's a weird thing. Um, I don't like composing so much, but I really like arranging. I like pulling apart people's music and understanding how it works and how it's put together. Mm -hmm. um, and whether it be for even like sax on it, just doing those pop song arrangements, I really kind of get a perverse joy out of like pulling things apart and putting them together. Yeah. Um, like that. So I, I, I enjoy doing it for sax on it too. For Nexus, um, we've done a lot over the years, really, haven't we? Um, yep. Like, I think I learned a lot arranging the Barber String Quartet years ago, actually. That's our first concert in Glebe. Yeah. I arranged the whole String Quartet. Oh, um, that's right. Because we did the had the adagio, and then you did the other movement. I did one three. Yeah, 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 yeah. One yeah. was like huge. So um, that was cool. Like doing this stuff with harp, like the Ravel or the Debussy, like particularly the Ravel, mm -hmm. it's quite a challenge um, and good. But even doing things like um, one of my favorite ones I ever did is very simple but very odd. Um, we did like we did a folk music concert, um, 
And we had the notion of including like two folk songs that like James Taylor and um, and Paul McCartney song, mm-hmm. Blackbird. And I, oh yeah, so I did like the Fire and Rain one by James Taylor. And then I tried to do Blackbird and it just didn't work at all. And then I don't know how I got the inspiration for it, but doing like Blackbird, but like floating down the river Ganges. So I kind of, I set it to a raga. And I still think that's probably one of my favorite arrangements where literally I have like Jay and I like the drone, Michael doing the raga and you doing the melody in this quasi Indian style over the top. I kind of, I think that's one of my favorite things I think I've done with Nexus is <laughs> cause it was so abstract, but it works so, works so well. So again, maybe like giving a lot of work a new life, like that's, you know, yeah. so different to the beautiful original, simple strum guitar melody. Um, yeah, I also have, as you kind of know, a minor obsession of doing jazz ballads as chorales. I kind of like doing that too. Yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I do love the kind of pulling apart things and putting them back together, understanding the harmony and the voicing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, as a composer, though, um, I'm not much of a composer. Um, yeah. Um, well, how'd you, how'd you get into it? But that's, that's a really good question, I suppose. So I actually stupidly did three unit composition in year 12. Mm-hmm. D- don't know why, I just did. Um, so rather than majoring in, comp- in performance at the th- year 12 I majored in comp, um, wrote a duo for Ben and Nick Carey, sax and clarinet, a string quartet and a sax quartet. And then I didn't write anything until we did that theatre production. Mm-hmm. And then I, I've always had ideas and I've really struggled with just... Um, getting beyond the initial idea. I'm not patient enough, I don't think, for it, or I don't devote enough time to it. You have to devote a lot of time to it, and I, I tend to devote time to my practice rather than being creative, I suppose. Um, so when Jay, the, years ago, asked for the little two-minute miniature, I'm like, I can do two minutes. Two minutes I can do. Like, mm-hmm. starts on a D, finishes on a D, and at that stage, as I said, you know, breath of worship, I had African skies looping in my head, so it literally came out of just something that had been looping in my head. So that's that one. The other two little attitudes on my website are like little things I wrote at the start of lockdown for students that I'll probably remove, I think. Um, One of them is not bad. But I actually wrote something else last week um, and sent it off to Neil. It's just a little kind of like, missed you, mate, haven't seen you this year, thought I'd be having a beer with you, haven't. Hmm. So I wrote him like a little two-minute... Starts on a D, finishes on a D. See, Jay could reuse this one. Jay, you can hmm. reuse this in this one. It could fit into that miniature series. It's slow, though. And I really like it. Um, that sounds odd, because I don't know. Norm, I'm pretty fussy with that kind of thing. I quite like it. It's slow. It's kind of just notes that I've been hearing, little patterns. It's, um, yeah, I don't know how to... I, I'll send you the sheet music. I'll put it up on my oh, website, cool. probably. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just a meandering, I suppose. I, I like it. Yeah. Hmm. It's just... It's kind of tonal. Yeah. Um, and I played it for a student in a lesson last week. And they're like, oh, that sounds really sad. And I'm like, okay, cool. Because that's kind of like, yeah. Um, I called it absence. So it's kind of got that that sense of feeling about it. But yeah, I'm not I'm not a composer. No. Yeah. But you I'll leave that to the real composers. They can be creative. Fair enough. Um, I'm not creative enough. Well, all right. Well, maybe with the arranging, maybe you can give us some uh, some tips on this. Um what advice would you give to a uh, sax player, say uh, someone who's predominantly been a performer, but you know wanted to branch out into arranging? What sort of skills and things should they work on to get their arranging chops up? Um, you have to have a really good sense of harmony. Mm-hmm. You know, um, if you're reducing something from an orchestral score or an eight-part score down to four voices, you need to understand how harmony works. What notes should I include? What should I exclude? Um, what's more important? What's less important? What's going to work timbrely? Um, you have good ears. If you're doing something that hasn't got a score, you've got to be able to go, oh yeah, what's that chord? Okay, yep, and they're doing that. And the counter's doing, you know, like so. Um, oral skills and harmony skills. Um, I had this awesome little book when I was in high school, like someone had given me about, there's a little book on arranging, it was like arranging for jazz bands and orchestra and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I used to read it all the time and um, get inspiration from that. But essentially, like the bulk of my arranging has been for quartet. And it's just been, 
um, or wind ensembles. And it's been just, yes, larger things condensed or piano works spread out. Um, and it's about understanding harmony and, and balance. Yeah, um, balance is important. You don't want things too heavy, you don't want them too empty. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and as you know, I'm a bit of um, a dinosaur technologically. Yes. Um, so these days I do it on the computer, but I've always in the past done it handwritten. Mm -hmm. So I do it in a very different method to most people. Like, like Jay inputs everything in concert pitch and then like mucks around. I actually do everything because I used to do it by hand, um, transpose straight away, straight into like, yeah. Yep. So I go, okay, the A for the cello is a C on bar, you know, so is the, is, yeah, the C on cello is the A on baritone is the, you know, so probably not the most time effective method, but that's how my brain works with it. I've always done it straight into transpose pitch because I've, I you see the chord and then think how that works in the B flats and the B flats. Right. Um, Kids don't need to do that anymore because they just press transpose. True. But of course, we didn't have a transpose button. Um, you don't want to write something out in C, then spend another few hours writing it out in E flat and B flat. And so, yeah, I always just did it straight off. Yep. Cool. All right. In <laughs> a very convoluted process, but um, yeah, no, hey, whatever works. Mm. All right, cool. Um, now, uh, not only are you a wonderful performer uh, that we've talked about, uh, but you're also a, a fantastic educator and mentor. Um, and, you know, you mentioned earlier your sort of, um, it's, you almost come full circle in terms of, you know, teaching at Newtown and uh, the Con High and um, sort of your experiences with those institutions and now you're sort of teaching there, full on there, and also now teaching at the Australian Institute of Music in Sydney. Um, yeah, that plane's pretty good, hey. Sorry, I've got a jet plane, mate. Like an A380 over my house. Yeah, it's right. A yeah, okay. busy night over there. Um, yeah, everyone's but, fleeing because of the new cases. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and um, sort of going on with what I was saying, um, you, you've taught you know some wonderful players who have gone on to have prof professional careers. Like we mentioned Sam Weller earlier, but you know you've got Mary Osborne as well, um, and several others I can't even recall because the list is quite large. But um, uh, maybe you could talk to, uh, talk to us a little bit about. Um, uh, the sort of things that you teach maybe at those three places to start off and you know maybe Scots as well because I know you teach there as well and maybe just talk about you know what the the saxophone studio that you have at each of those institutions like and the sort of things and the curriculum that you would cover okay um, so um, I'm pretty lucky like a lot of people think that um, I've produced all these wonderful students and I suppose I have but at the same time I firmly believe that they've produced themselves as well. Mm -hmm. Like, I think a lot of my wonderful students would have been wonderful students learning off anyone half decent. The kids got the drive, they've got the passion. Um, you know, if they've got someone half decent, they'll make it. So, um, I wouldn't like to take all the credit. I think a lot of it comes down to being very fortunate of having taught a whole lot of driven, enthusiastic, and brilliant students as well. Um, so, I don't think I can take all the credit um, at all. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty fortunate. I teach at, like, the, for high schools, I teach at the two selected music high schools in Sydney. Mm -hmm. um, that does help. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I suppose that presents a whole lot of different challenges to your average teacher, you know? So, um, you mentioned Scots, but I also taught at Barker for over a decade. Yes. And, um, like Barker's got a fantastic music program too. Um, but in the main, the kind of students you'll get somewhere like Newtown and, and the Con are different because they're that, they're that high level. Um, mm. They're really driven, they're really focused. Now you will get high level driven focused students at all schools. But like um, at Newtown next year, I have five students going into year 12, four of whom are doing three unit performance. Right. Now, you don't get that at your average high school. Now, those four students are fantastic. Like, some of them are really good. Um, and I kind of feel sorry for the lesser player because I think they'd be the top at any other school, just about. Yeah. Um, you know. But th th it's a positive for them too because it helps bring them up because they're being dragged along by their, their classmates. So... 
my teaching at somewhere like Newtown and the Con is quite different to um, other schools. Um, I think one of the best things about the Con High is that from year seven to year 12, I get the kid for an hour a week. Um, that, that's awesome, mm. you know? Um, one of the cool things with the Con High is you get really advanced students, but give me a kid who's, and I'll use Justin Liu as an example. Justin Liu was third grade borderline when he got into the Con High. Um, but if I have you for six years for an hour a week, I have the time in which to do things like technically and musically. So where you start off isn't so important because we have that, that time. Like even someone coming in at third grade, normally if you have a third grade student, you don't teach them for an hour, you teach them for 30 minutes. But because I have an hour with them from the get go, you can really work on ironing out their technique, really improving upon the fundamentals as well as teaching them all the repertoire. Mm -hmm. um, so that by the end, by year 12, you should be producing a damn good saxophone player. Yeah. Like they got an hour with me for six years. Um, they're also playing in the chamber ensembles. They're also surrounded by great musicians. So I think one of the things that's great about like the con high is I'm able to really nail the kids on their technique and instill on them my technical beliefs and habits and regimes. Um, particularly because at the end of the year they have um, a performance exam mm -hmm. And they in that performance exam, there is technical requirements and repertoire requirements. I set the technical requirements. No <laughs> one else. It's up to me. And you know that I'm not a nice person. So No, not like, with technique. <laughs> no. So like for my year ten students, like um from I expect at least from year nine or ten up for everyone to do all scraps, like all twelve keys, all major, all minor, like harmonic melodic. The arpeggios, dominance, diminished, major thirds, minor thirds, chromatics, whole tones, you know, and because they're doing that from those years onwards, um, they have the means to play the repertoire. They have the th finger dexterity, you know. Mm -hmm. So then, when they're in year twelve, I know that they've got the raw chops. Um, now, a school like Newtown, I, I kind of instill the same philosophies. Mm -hmm. It's different. No, there's no like school-based exams or anything. Um, but conversely, I've got to prepare them in a different way because they've got um. They've got more performance opportunities. They've got more ensemble work. Their skill set has to be a bit diverse in the con high because um, they're playing in jazz bands and stuff too, which um, and big band, which doesn't happen at the con high. Yeah. Um, so, and I, I teach A and B at all these institutions and move the, the students through the grades. And the same thing happens at Scotts, and the same thing happened at Barker. Um, and depending on the student, you know, because you have to tailor the journey for the individual student. What's What's the student want? What are we trying to achieve? Um, that could be HSC three unit. It could be HSC course one. You know, um, it could be just them in playing music for the love of it. Um, you've got to make sure that we can get the best results possible for them. Um, I had a boy do course one last year. He nailed it. Like, and that was really satisfying. It doesn't have to be someone going to the con. You know, he's a really good sax player. He got full marks for everything because he was a great sax player doing course one. Um, so it's being able to give them the technical means to achieve what they want to and the repertoire they want to mm -hmm. and finding their, their repertoire. So like I said, I've got those four kids doing three in it in Newtown. Obviously they need different programs. I can't have the kids playing the same stuff, but the kids have different musical personalities. You know, what one kid's gonna love learning and playing and performing isn't gonna be the same as the other and it's not what suits their, their strengths and weaknesses either. So it's about me tailoring repertoire that will engage the student, excite the student, and get the best out of them too. Yeah. Um, so that's all for the the high school level. Yeah, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, for sure. And what about um, the um, your teaching studio at AIM? Uh, how do you how does that approach differ? Um, massively. <laughs> well, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah. Different yeah, level, different I'm standard. Yeah. And um, I hold a different bar to tertiary, like. I hold a pretty high standard to my students in the selective music schools, um, but I hold a very high one for the tertiary. Like, if you're there doing a tertiary, you've got to be damn serious. Mm. Um, and a pre I set a pretty big workload too. Um, this year has been a funny one with everything being online this year. Of course. Um, but I was really proud of my master's boy who I found out got a fantastic Markley recital, which was so good because it was so tough doing 
the kind of repertoire he was doing with pre-recorded tracks, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I was really proud of the, the hard work he put in and the effort he went to to get that. Um, yeah, it, it, again, it depends on the student, what, what level they come in. People come in at different standards, you know. Um, my postgrad boy was a very high standard. Some of the undergrad students need more um, more work on foundations. Like he, my postgrad boy came to me with like wonderful setup. Didn't have to talk about embouchure or articulation, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but with some of the undergrads, you're like, okay, we have to rebuild you from the ground up. Um, this is what you've known before. This is what we need to do to um, get you to achieve what you want to do. So trying to figure out what the student wants to achieve in the long term and provide them with the necessary means to achieve that. Um, what's nice about it with AIM is it's such a small campus and a beautiful campus now and we can really go about that in a really, um, really close-knit way. Mm. Yeah. Nice. All right, mm. cool. And um, uh, you've touched on this in terms of, you know, each uh, teaching situation that you're in. But um, is there anything you'd like to add in terms of what your sort of overall teaching philosophy is? I know it's a bit of a loaded question because it really does sort of determine, uh, it's oh, no, no, determined no, no, by no, the student. Not at all. I, um, I, I believe I, I teach through the Socratic method. Mm -hmm. So um, Socrates. So Socrates used to teach through asking questions. And... I'm a firm believer in that method of teaching. So I'm always asking my students questions, always. And I try to explain them in their first lesson. I don't expect them to know the answer all the time, at all. But the most important thing I think for a student is to be able to critically think for themselves and analyse what they're doing, how, why. Because um, if they learn that skill, then their progress will go through the roof. Because it's really easy for me as a teacher to sit there and go, that was wrong, that was wrong, that was wrong, fix it. What's important is if when the student starts to realise that themselves, then their progress will go through the roof. Mm -hmm. So I always teach from the ground up, like from the very first lessons to the postgrad, Socratic, you know. What were your thoughts? How did you think you played? What do you think could be better? What was, what was good? What, what needs improvement? Okay, you didn't like your tone. How can we fix your tone? What can we do to fix it? What are the elements that we can instill and um, we can alter in your playing to achieve those goals. So um, the ability for um, to analyse what they're doing is, is the most vital thing, I think. And some kids get it. Some mm -hmm. kids are really good at analysing what they do and some kids are just woeful at it. Uh, I'm not meaning so much, but you see this in tertiary students that people that um, just, they play and they have no idea what they've done. <laughs> um, and that's... That, that's hard. Like if you've not got this ability to analyze what you're doing and how to fix it, um, then you, you're incredibly reliant upon a teacher. Um, Mark Walton said this to me, and uh, some people thought it was a bit rich, but I think it's spot on. He said, your most important teacher is you. Um, you are the one who has to hold yourself to account. You have to pull apart everything you're doing. So your teacher will just open doors for you that you didn't you couldn't imagine, you didn't know it existed. Um, so I'm a big believer in um, this kind of, like I mentioned before, that kind of magpie approach where you grab bits and pieces from everywhere. But the ability to analyse all this information and put it into a package and create a larger whole. Mm. So that's why um, a lot of my students don't sound like me um, because I'm not telling them how to play like me. I'm trying to get them to think critically for themselves too. I have had one student who finished two years ago, who, they sounded too much like me. It was really creepy. Um, hmm. They were a very diligent, hardworking student and listened to everything I said and applied it to the letter. And it's the first time I've ever taught someone where I sat back and was going, oh, that oh. sounds like me. It's a clone. Playing it just how I'd play. <laughs> Ooh, you know, like, um, it's, it's kind of nice to see a kid's musical personality kind come through rather than seeing a weird little clone of yourself because I'm not trying to create clones of me. Mm. God knows the world doesn't need that. <laughs> true, true. Um, now, you were saying before, uh, back when you were studying, that um, you were um, a very firm believer that, you know, you could, you know, that everyone could get at least one thing out of different teachers and things like that. Uh, so I'm going to throw the question to you. What would, the one, what would one thing be that you would like students to take away from lessons with you? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, <clears throat> for my longer term students, it would be the ability to analyze and what they've done and how they've done it. Um, if someone's having a one-off lesson, <clears throat> it'd be that magpie approach, you know? Um, some people come to you and they've clearly got a particular weakness and you need to discuss that. So it might be their articulation, it might be their on the show, it might be um, a lack of musicality. If they can take away something that really inspires them in terms of improving their musicality or that is their raw technique, then it's been a great thing. So for my long-term students, I'd say critical analysis. Um, but for the short-term students, anything. As I said, one, one inspiring thing, you know, it's about getting that one little nugget of wisdom that can, um, you know, help um, create other avenues for exploration. You know, like a little, little seed blossoms into a flower, blooms, you know, mm -hmm. those kind of little moments like that. So, yeah, and that can be in so many different areas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Now, <coughs> um, one of the hot topics for 2020 has been, of course, uh, the US election. No, 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 jokes. COVID-19. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, yeah, everyone knows it's been quite detrimental to the music industry um, and uh, has had a significant impact on what we've been able to do. Um, for you, how have you found COVID-19 to affect you? Like, obviously, a lot of your teaching had to move online and perform. Uh, I know for a fact that a lot of the performance opportunities that we had booked in had been either postponed or cancelled. Um, but, you know, maybe you can talk us through sort of how it's affected you and the sort of things you've done to try and adapt and sort of get through it, I guess. So I'll talk about the negatives and the positives, I think. So mm -hmm. I, I think we'll look at the negatives first up. Yep. Um, as you know, I have a young family. I have three young girls. Uh, six, four, and 19 months. So when we were in lockdown in Sydney, um, that made things really tough. Like my wife had a new job. She was working at the time, four days a week. Um, and I have, I actually have, for those who don't know, I have three days teaching. So I have Monday, Tuesday, where I'm, I look after my girls full time. Then I smash all my teaching into Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, when COVID hit, um, my wife works Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. So all of a sudden, um, I had to look after our girls Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. I had to homeschool my eldest, kind of school the middle mm -hmm. one, and look after the youngest one all at the same time um, for four days a week. So obviously all teaching or practice or anything like that was rendered impossible on those days. Then I had to effectively squash my three days teaching into kind of two days. Um, Jeez. Like a Wednesday and a Saturday. And it was just like wall to wall, like eight to <clears throat> eight to eight or something stupid, um, all online. And obviously on those days, there was no interaction with my family. There was no practice. I was just teaching on a computer like this um, all day. So, um, you know, I'm not tech savvy, we have to get a new computer, we have to get a microphone, all mm -hmm. that stuff now, so it's wonderful, but I had to completely upskill on that front straight away. Um, but it was really hard because I wasn't, I wasn't practicing, I wasn't playing, only in lessons, I certainly wasn't performing. Um, I was just smashed too, uh, physically and mentally. Um, so I found that period incredibly difficult. Um, gradually as things opened up and we got back to teaching in person, that actually made it easier for me. Um, <coughs> but lockdown was horrid. I think lockdown kind of went two ways. If you had no children and no, like some people just had all day to play and then people in my mm -hmm. situation had no time. So yeah. I found that really tough. I found losing all our performance opportunities incredibly difficult. Um, I remember like the particular day we'd just done the, we'd just done that gig for um, Music of V that was awesome. We were kind of oh, the concourse. with the quartet. Mm. And the next week, a, a teaching I normally schedule in some practice like before students or things that I get in there. And, and I had this pile of music like this that we had to learn for the rest of the year. And I, I was just looking at it and I was thinking, is, is there any point? I don't think we're actually going to play any of this. And then I found it just 
really um, hard to want to practice um, because I, I couldn't see a, a reason at first. So that made it difficult. And that didn't last too long, I must say. I'm a, I'm a bit of a, you know, a, a junkie for the saxophone. You know, I, I kind of need my, need my fix. So I found all that really negative. It was really hard to feel motivated. No performances, hard to practice, um, exhaustion. Uh, then I found like little avenues, little nuggets of amazement that really um, helped get me through the period. Um, I think yours is loosely based on one of them. So uh, Nathan and I were both watching a Q and A series done with um, in America with um, Nathan Nab, was a great saxophonist. He was interviewing a lot of American saxophone players, and I was just listening to a bunch of these. And my wheels were snapping or late at night when I were in bed. And while I wasn't actually playing or performing, I was taking in these little pearls of wisdom, all these bits of in inspiration from these talks and understanding people's journeys or particular thoughts on particular elements of playing and just storing it in here or actively trying to apply it in my own teaching or mine. Um, and Jean Dennis Michat had that small little, you know series he did too which i found really inspiring mm -hmm. so little little moments like this that all of a sudden amongst all this hardness kind of reinvigorated me and in a different way um i think one of the really good things for me it's been a really weird year like we haven't played as much i haven't worked as much but a whole lot of um a whole lot of notions in my playing and how i want to play and what i want to do have kind of crystallized and i kind of feel um, particularly like the last week it's kind of funny like after the gig mm -hmm. the gig on Wednesday but I think I've played the saxophone really well since that gig because we've got the performance and I'm like okay I'm kind of back in the saddle and oh yes this is um, this is what I want to do this is how things are working so something's kind of clicked mentally for me this year and I feel better about certain aspects of my playing I feel like certain notions have crystallised this year and that's happened not through necessarily playing but through listening Mm -hmm. saying listen to people talk listen to chats like this or to listening to more music i've i've listened to more music this year than i have in the past six i think um because that's been one of the things for the year you know i haven't yeah. been out and about so i've been um getting inspiration from doing a lot more listening which is great i've been reinvigorated on that front so yeah those are kind of been some of the little positives i've taken out of it and mm -hmm. um i think it's wonderful that you're doing this series because it's kind of you know those moments that you can go oh, okay i'm looking for some inspiration you know oh what's happening in the the musical mind of paul cutton you know what are his what are his musical thoughts or what's the what's the story behind um michael duke studying in america what's um what's nicholas Wisniello thinking about when he's writing for saxophone you know all these kind of things <coughs> have been um have wonderful so there's a positive you know um as well um yeah so it's, it's been a funny old year um i've now been i'm online a bit more too i suppose like I've, as i said got more youtube things because i've been forced to kind of do that mm -hmm. and that's something i want to do more going forward I, um one of my big goals next month is not next month next year is just to record myself more even not for like commercial release just for my own goals yeah um just like regularly just laying down an attitude just to hear myself back Mm -hmm. you know um yeah doing a lot more recording and self-analysis but also like playing things for youtube as well um i'm gonna do a lot more solo stuff next year and and put that out um but also just general playing yeah no it's interesting um like i mean for me that's sort of one of the things i found um uh i got onto the uh the instagram bandwagon and um one of the things i've was doing I tried out was the hundred days of practice thing and I actually started that before COVID and then COVID hit and then it's sort of been a very sporadic journey but um, I completed it and um, I actually found that was quite a an interesting thing to do just to sort of force yourself to uh, force yourself is a bit of a strong word but you know to record yourself put it out there and you know listening back and learning from it and I think that's an important point yeah, and that's one I've, I've done last week in the last week too um there's for those that don't know, there's a saxophone age of the week thing on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, the 12 days of furling. And every year they do like a, a furling thing at Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, 
I've always encouraged my students to go on that and, and do it. Um, never done it myself. And then last week I had a student not show up. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, okay, the feeling but was there. I just like one take wonders for both of them. Laid them down, like boom. Nice. There we go. It's on the internet. Um, is it perfect? No. Um, it was one take wonder. Mm. Um, but it was good for me just to go, oh, this is what I'm doing. This is a little goal for this practice, you know. We've just done the concert with Nexus. Yep. You no. Know? Um, things like that are, are good. Yeah. Mm. Um, now, I've got a, a bit of a deep question for you, um, but um, yeah, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on it. Um, and it's an interesting one because it, it still is probably too early to tell, but at, as it currently stands, and you know, fingers crossed everything sort of stays as it is and things you know, start continuing to um, incrementally get better, how do you envisage a musical scene uh, the Australian musical landscape in a post-COVID environment, in particular with a, a emphasis and focus on that the sac- classical saxophone scene here. Okay. Um, yeah. Look, it's a tough one. It's a really mm. tough one. Um, and there's the part of me that is hopeful, and there's the part of me that's very negative. The negative part of me feels like we may have seen the death of the orchestral concert. Um, I feel that financially, that's going to be hard moving forward. Um, it's always been hard mm. in the last few years pre-COVID to the orchestras to make enough money, get enough funding to, to pump out these things. So we've been doing more and more commercial things the last few years, the film scores and things to try and make, make good money. Now I feel that either the orchestra will rebirth really strongly or it will just die. Or maybe it was it won't be as we know it. There will no longer be the people on secure salaries doing the orchestra. You won't have the same people playing together all the time. Maybe it will move to a tragically a freelance method where it's different players all the time so they don't learn to blend or play as a group as tightly um, then maybe the economics will demand that I'm a bit worried about large ensemble stuff and I'm kind of scared by um, the reduction in concert hall numbers Mm -hmm. reluctance to people to go out I think I think we're very fortunate that you and I play chamber music (laughs) yeah Um, I, I feel happy about that I feel optimistic too that one of the things I think COVID will force I hope this is the case, um, to remove some of the cultural cringe we have in Australia and to get us to embrace our own artists and use them more. You know? You have a series here that you've, I don't know how many people you've interviewed now. We have some fantastic saxophonists in Sydney. We really do. Some fantastic saxophonists in Australia. That's our own instrument, let alone the other instruments. You know, we, I'm hoping that for festivals and, and things, we start to use, um, a lot more Australian artists because we have some top top notch ones here, and um, hopefully they get used more rather than relying on the big overseas talent to fill out roles, whether it be festivals or opera or concerto soloists or festival. You know, like it's great to see Sydney Festival this year's Aussie artists. You know, mm. it's normally you know. Oh look, we have an underwater theatre production from Germany. Great. Yeah. What do you do? It's amazing, great. It's it's wonderful, it's amazing. It's wonderful you've paid all that money to bring all those people out for that. And um, you're advertising it so strongly. But then they then go back to Germany, you know. Um, So I think there's probably, like, I think we do need things like that too. Mm. Um, But I'm hoping that we'll get, yeah, some real traction for Australian artists. Um, The streaming thing is going to be really interesting. Mm. I think that's going to be here to stay. I think it's also a positive and it's a negative. Like, I think it's wonderful that we can do Melbourne Digital Concert Hall and that anyone in the country or overseas can listen to us. That's yep. great. That's really cool. It means we make more money. Wonderful, blah. But that means that that concert you tend to do as a chamber group, which you might do in five cities. You know, someone like um, the Australian String Quartet, why would you see them in five different cities and they can stream at once? Like, yeah. I'm not going to go and see them in Sydney if I can stream it, you know, like, you know what I mean? So like, mm-hmm. um, or maybe I'll go and see in Sydney, but not stream it. So it's, you know, like there's, um, there's that fine line. I think some people won't 
it might be harder to tour things if you're going to be streaming to the whole nation. Maybe it won't. I don't know. I really don't know. But, you know, that European method of this is our program and we'll play this program in 20 different countries. Mm-hmm. I think that might be coming to an end. I don't know. Um, yeah. So I'm not sure about that. I'm, I'm scared for the future performance, but it could be that thing where it just snaps back. Two people will be so desperate for it that they're, they're hungry for it. I think... I hope it revitalizes it in a new way. Like there was talk about doing the alfresco dining in, in the Sydney CBD with more outdoor performances. That could be fantastic. I don't know if it's going to happen. I, mm-hmm. I like, there's a lot of talk, but I want to see some, some action. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I think, yeah, um, hopefully as we get a more vibrant um, suburbs, you know, whether it be... Chatswood or the CBD, all these areas where there's there's music happening outdoors or in the precinct areas, you yeah, know. or somewhere random like don't know yet. Yeah. yeah. So these are things I hope will happen. Um, yeah, I'm scared for the the big companies, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's it's sort of yeah, it's an interesting one, but I think. Uh, a positive thing, like uh, the concert we did on Wednesday at the old 505, I think that, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's probably the first concert we've done in front of a live audience since COVID started, the last one being in March at the Concourse yeah, Theatre. The first kind of serious sit down concert. Like yes. We excluded Orange playing at the, the, the winery, um, which, whilst everyone was sitting down and listening to us, it wasn't like a, a formal concert. Yeah. So, yeah, it was really interesting because my first experience doing it, and I mm-hmm. loved it. It was so good that. It, yeah, back on the saddle, so to speak, and I think a lot of the audience loved it too. Just like, well, a, yeah, the concert. How good's this? You know? That's that's the point I was thinking. Like, just sort of like the fact that the amount of people that came up to us and were just incredibly, you know, thankful for having live music. And again, I'm not big noting us anyway, but just it was just, they were very genuine in how they felt about it. And you know, it's things like that that I think is gonna gives you a bit of a positive hope that you know I, live I music so. is yeah, still that, that's, relevant. That's spot on, mate. Um, it does make me feel positive moving forward because, like, watching something on the computer or the TV is nice. It's, it's just not the same. It's not yeah. the same as being in the room and having that wash of sound or hearing the nuance or really being immersed in it. I think the immersion is this thing that, at the moment, you can't replicate on the TV or the or the computer, which yeah. you can in a real concert. You know, it's um, you know, and that's for me maybe the the main thing that like those large ensembles like the Sydney Symphony might have going for it, like the power of an orchestra, you don't get that on the computer or the TV. No, it's you something you have to experience. It's something you have to be there for. Yeah. You know, um, the raw power of it is is startling. Um, and I think we had that in the review, you know, that it, it felt orchestral. And I suppose it would feel to orchestral to people that haven't seen an orchestral concert or something like that for so long. And all of a mm-hmm. sudden, four sax bands in the heart, there's this wash of sound and colour. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's that immersion in sound that I hope is, um, yeah, one of the main points going forward. Mm. All right. Well, we're coming to the tail end, and um, we're going to finish on a bit more of a positive note. Um, but uh, we start with the the second last question, which is a bit of a, a signature question in these series these days, um, and that would be. If you only had 10 minutes, and you know, this could be in between students or students running late, if you only had 10 minutes to practice, what would it be and why? The, um, for, for those of you that don't know me, I'm a long note junkie. Like, <laughs> I'm kind of addicted to them. So, I also have, like, I have a little technical routine, as I said, I kind of mentioned that with my students, and I have it in different packages. Like, if I have the whole day to practice, that technical routine can take about an hour. But generally I have it crystallized down to half an hour because I know I can knock it out every day um, in that little half an hour moment and everything then stays in form. So that that includes like flexibility, mm-hmm. um, uh, whether it be with the mouthpiece or overtones. Then it includes the long notes and it includes some scale dexterity too. But a large focus of it is um, tone production and intonation. So if I have 10 minutes, the Andrew maybe a week ago would have said long notes. Mm-hmm. Um, Andrew of this week, a different creature. 
Um, as I said, I'm, you know, I, I'm still going to play long notes all the time and I practice. But maybe for this week, it might be me reading through an ancient, you know, um, reading through something different, like to try and get the brain engaged and playing something and trying to hear what I'm playing, looking at it on the paper and trying to hear that and um, execute that. Um, maybe that's this week. Um, mm. Normally I would say long notes. Long notes, um, different dynamics, different ranges, with and without vibrato. Because um, I'm, I'm at that point in my life, and my, my, I can move my fingers. Like yeah. I do practice scales, but I, I can move them. I've done the, I've done the, I've done the hours on that. They can always be tidier. Mm. And in fact, um, that was one of the things I noticed post lockdown. That little bit of, um, I had lost a bit of cleanliness in my fingers and dexterity, and it took a little while to get back. Longer than I would have appreciated. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, long notes or at the moment maybe maybe just an attitude. I'm that's something that's going to be moving forward for me. I think it's more, as I said, recording myself, playing and listening to the line. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right, Andrew. Thank you very much for uh, joining us this evening and sharing your thoughts and your experiences and your uh, semi life story. Um, it's it's always a pleasure to have a chat. Um, a bit weird t- talking virtually again, but uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll meet up face to face at some stage soon. Yeah. Um, in terms of just keeping up to date with what's happening with Andrew Smith and um, you know what you're up to and performances and things like that, what's the uh, best way to sort of keep an eye out for what you're up to? Well, for anything Nexus, um, it's our subscribe to our mailing list. Mm-hmm. Um, follow us on Facebook, mm-hmm. um, on Instagram, as all the young kids are doing these days. Mm-hmm. Um, website, yeah. For me, for me personally, I do have a website. I'm pretty bad with it, though. I have to admit, um, that's something I made a conscious decision not really to touch um, after COVID hit. I just kind of went. It was a bit soul destroying. So rather than just like writing cancelled on everything, I just kind of left it. Mm-hmm. Um, sadly, because now I didn't update it for all the concerts we have actually done since. Yeah, I probably should have. Um, I'm bad with it. I'm a bit French like that, you know. <laughs> um, but 2021 is pretty exciting for you. I 2021 is very exciting for me, and I'm actually going to update the website and be more regular with it because besides, like our quartet's hectic in the first half of the year, really hectic. Yeah, no. But I've also got. Um, a bunch of things happening that I need to be really on top of in terms of my own personal organization, but also promoting. Mm-hmm. Um, I was talking to Brearley Cutting, who's the new piano lecturer at AIM, and we're, we're going to do some playing together next year and some concerts at AIM and around the place too. Cool. And she's awesome. And like, I threw some suggestions at her and she's like, well, that's it. It's a bit conservative. It's a bit easy. Don't you think? I'm like, oh, I like you. This is good. <laughs> you know, so um, I'm going to be doing some stuff with her. I'm going to be working with a bunch of these composers again. Um, there's a bunch of things that have already been booked for um, in the new music sphere for different projects. So that's looking good. So yeah, my website, asmithsax.com. Yep. Or you, um, I don't have a like a, an artist page on Facebook. I just have a, a profile. But um, look, if you ask my friendship, I'll say yes. I don't ask people's friendship, but if you ask mine, I might say yes. <laughs> and I normally post about my concerts on my, my personal page. So if you don't mind the occasional photo of my daughters, um, <laughs> that's not a bad way to know. Um, cool, cool. I'll put a pretty link bad on... on the socials though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll put a link on the on the YouTube thing here. Um, but you have also forgotten. Most importantly, we do have a gig this weekend. Yeah, you and I are playing in like two days. We've got a sax summit gig on Saturday. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, how good's that? Yeah, River yeah. Beach, so, yeah, yeah. So one of my favourite places in the world, and yep. it's gonna be my last gig for the year. So I'm going out in a bang. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So for those who don't know, uh, we haven't really talked about it, but Sack Summit is like a bit of a silly Our side project. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's sort of like a covers band, but on saxophones. And uh, yeah, we'll be out and about at Coogee Beach this Saturday. Maribra, uh, Maribra. Maribra sorry. Uh, weather permitting, of course. Um, okay, so um, thanks so much again, uh, Andrew. It's been absolutely fantastic having a chat. So yes, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for all those who have been watching and uh, uh, keeping up to date with everything that's happening this year with the Q&A series. Um, uh, I just want to extend a big thanks to each and every one of you for tuning in, watching, and you know, sending some good feedback on it. It's um, started off as a bit of a, a whim and um, a bit of an opportunity to catch up with people and it's sort of grown exponentially since since then. And um, uh, yeah, it's, it's really... Uh, 
sort of gotten a lot bigger than I thought it had and it's a, a great up thing and uh, look I'm definitely continuing on for next year for those who have liked the Sydney Saxophone Network Facebook page you'll notice I've actually created a poll um, uh, for your suggestions on who you'd like to see on the 2021 season uh, happy to report that I've uh, approached a few people and secured a few interviews for next year starting in January with the the wonderful Richard Percival um, who I'll be um, uh, having a chat with um, also, big news is I'll be relocating the uh, secret headquarters here of the Q&A sessions. Uh, this is my last broadcast from this particular room. Um, so uh, you'll have to bear with me over the coming weeks uh, when yeah, things are sort of getting reconnected and put together. But anyway, uh, I I'm digress. Gonna interrupt you though. I'm going to interrupt you and say on the, like on behalf of the Sydney Saxophone community in the broader Australian one, thank sure. you very much for the series. It's been awesome. It's a lot of work for Nathan to do this. Like... It's um, a massive undertaking and it's been really beneficial for all of us. Um, like, like I mentioned before in the talk, you know, if we, um, if you can listen to these and take away one awesome bit of wisdom from someone or some driving thing that will help push you forward, you've made a whole lot of progress over the course of, the, you know, these chats. So it's a really good source of inspiration and just ideas for people. So thank you, Nathan. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So on that note, um, I am going to give everyone a big cheers uh and i'm going to say have a merry happy holiday and new year um uh, we do ask that you do keep safe and well during this time and we look forward to uh, having you join us next year uh, 2021 in january for uh the recommencement and continuation of the q a sessions so thank you all and good night